Last week, we went through the five hardest questions on the IFR knowledge test. Since that was so popular and so many pilots are asking for more, we're going to go through the five hardest questions on the commercial test now. Here's question one. We've given some information and asked to use the table to compute how much fuel we burn on a climb out to 12,000 feet. This is just an exercise in following the chart step by step. Our aircraft weight is 3,700 pounds, so we're looking at the middle of the chart. We're climbing to 12,000 feet, but we're starting at 4,000, so we want to know the figures for both of those altitudes. What we want to do is take the fuel burned climbing from sea level to 12,000 feet and subtract the fuel burned going from sea level to 4,000 feet, since we're already starting there at 4,000. The fuel burn of 37 to go to 12,000 is subtracted by the fuel burn of 12 to get to 4,000, and we're left with 25 pounds of fuel. Now, on note 2, it says we need to increase this amount by 10% for each 7 degrees Celsius above standard temperature we're at. First, we need to find standard temperature. At sea level, this is 15 degrees Celsius. This is the first definition of standard temperature. The second definition is that it drops 2 degrees for every 1,000 feet of altitude gained. So up at 4,000 feet, standard is only 7 degrees. Today's temperature at 4,000 feet is 21. So with standard is 7, we're 14 degrees above standard. The note says to add 10% for each 7 we're above, and so we're twice that amount above, we add 10% twice. 10% of 25 is 2.5. So adding that twice gives us 30 pounds of fuel burn. Now we need to look at note one, which says we add 16 pounds of fuel for engine start, taxi, and takeoff. So that's easy. We add 16 to our 30 to get a total fuel burn of 46 pounds, and we see that answer choice in among the options. Question two is a weather one. It asks what conditions are most likely to result in freezing precipitation. Freezing rain is liquid rain that's been supercooled, meaning it's in liquid form, but it's below freezing point. It just hasn't crystallized to ice because there was nothing in contact with it to freeze around. This changes, of course, when it hits your wing and other air surfaces and turns to ice fast. In order for it to form, it first falls as precipitation, like snow, and passes through warm air above freezing and melts into rain, then falls back into freezing air where it's cooled below freezing. Let's look at our choices. Choices A and B really say the same thing. Freezing point of water is 32 Fahrenheit or 0 Celsius. So both A and B basically is saying it's falling from freezing air into warmer air. And this is rain, liquid rain that's not super cooled and won't freeze on contact. Choice C is precip that falls through a warm air mass, then goes into a freezing air mass where it gets super cooled. Question 3 deals with METAR remarks. This is a tag on the METAR string after the basic weather information that some larger terminals will add. Let's decode this one. We'll need to know some of the National Weather Service abbreviations. FZ is freezing, DZ is drizzle. Those two are also found on the precipitation string of the normal part of the METAR, so they should be a little bit more familiar than these others. W shift is wind shift, and FROPA is frontal passage. Let's see our choices. We can rule out B here because it references wind shear, not wind shift. And we can rule out A because the B42 after the freezing drizzle in the same text string wouldn't make sense referring to cloud bases. This string refers to precipitation, and the B42 means it began 42 minutes after the hour. That leaves choice C, mentioning the wind shift, which occurred 30 minutes after the hour. There's no B before the 30 because it didn't begin at that time. It occurred then, and it isn't a constant process like the drizzle. Question 4 is going to take some time. We've given a bunch of information and asked to do some cross-country calculations. We need to determine the time, compass heading, distance, and fuel consumed in the descent. The first thing we need to do is figure out how much time it takes to descend. With the airport at 700 feet and our descent ending 800 feet above the ground, will be going down to an MSL altitude of 1,500 feet. Going from 6,500, this is a descent of 5,000 feet. Dividing the 500 feet per minute into that, we get a 10-minute descent, so we can already eliminate choice C. Let's see how much fuel we're going to burn. Our burn rate is 8.5 gallons per hour. We need to convert our 10-minute descent time into hours by dividing it by 60. We take that result and multiply it by 8.5 to get 1.4 gallons burned. We can already tell that the answer is going to be A here, but let's keep going. We need to do a wind calculation using our E6B. Here are the steps. 
first, we want to set the wind direction under true index, so we'll spin 060 degrees under center. Then we'll make a red mark up from the center point, which is on our airspeed 110, for 15 knots of wind speed. We'll then spin the disk so our true course is under center. This moves that red mark we made. Next, we slide the disk so the red mark sits on our true airspeed of 110. The red mark is measured eight hash marks away from center. This means our wind correction angle is eight degrees right. We'll be adding that to our true course and then adding the variation of three degrees west, east is least, west is best, then adding the compass deviation of two to that. All that adding gets us a compass heading of 348 degrees. Now let's find the distance we're gonna travel in the descent. Our ground speed reads under center, it's 108 knots. Our descent takes 10 minutes as we found earlier, which converted to hours is 10 over 60. If we multiply that by the ground speed, we get 18 miles. So we have all the info to answer this question, and it's still choice A. That was a long one. Lastly, we're told we've flown 52 miles, but are six miles off the centerline course to our destination. We have 118 miles to correct and get back on course to our destination. To find the total correction angle, we need to know about the one in 60 rule. It means that when 60 miles from a point, being one degree off will take us one mile off course. We're six miles off course, so if we were 60 miles from our departure point, we'd be off by six degrees, but we're only 52 miles off. So being six miles off required a bit more of a deviation than six degrees. Let's divide 60 and 52, then multiply our six miles off course to get a correction of 6.9 degrees. This is only half the battle though. If we correct 6.9 degrees, we'll be parallel to our course, but we won't be reconverging with it in time to make our destination. We need to correct further. One in 60 rule again. 60 divided by 118 and then multiply by six and we get 3.1 degrees further correction needed. Taking these together, we get a total course correction needed of 10 degrees. These are hard, but you're training to be a commercial pilot, so it's time to get real. If these cram sessions are helpful, we'll do more involved test preps in the future. This week is Oshkosh, and Flight Insight courses are on sale 20% through July 28th. This includes our all-access plan that gets you all eight of our great courses and saves you hundreds. Also, I'll be on the grounds at Oshkosh this week. You'll know me by my Flight Insight shirt, and you can also come by the Four Flight meet and greet on Wednesday at 10 a.m. at booth 747. Hope to see you all there.